forgive us and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on us. And we send salat and salam on his last and final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first surah of the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha. And Surah Al-Fatiha is very important because this is the surah that we read every single day in our salat. Every single rakah that we pray, be it whatever salat. If we pray Fart Salat, we pray Sunnah, we pray Wajib, we pray Witter Salat, any Salat we pray, we always pray, we always recite Surah Al Fatiha. So if we pray behind the Imam, we do not pray behind the Imam, we pray by ourselves, we still have to read Surah Al Fatiha. So we'll go through the explanation of Surah Al Fatiha. Surah Al Fatiha, as you know, there are many other names. We understand it to be the name of Surah Al-Fatiha. This was a name that we are accustomed to. But it is not the only name of Surah Al-Fatiha. Of Surah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. One of the names is Surah Al-Fatiha. But there are many other names for the same Surah. And likewise you will see many Surahs in the Quran. You might see in the content a specific name is given. But there are other names also for that same Surah. So Surah Al-Fatiha has 11 names. So not only one name, but there's 11 names for the same Surah, which is Surah Al-Fatiha. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrated that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, umm al-Qur'an, wa umm al-Kitab, wa sab'u al-Mathani, wa al-Qur'an al-Azim. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, that Surah. So Surah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, he says, it is Umm Al-Qur'an, it is the mother of the Qur'an. So one of the names of Surah Al-Fatiha is also Umm Al-Qur'an or Umm Al-Kitab, the mother of the Qur'an or the mother of the book. And then he says, Wasab'u Al-Mathani, it is also known as As-Sab'u Al-Mathani. Sab'u in Arabic means seven, and Al-Mathani means repeated. So, Asab al Mathani means the seven ayahs which is mostly repeated. From all the surahs of the Quran, Surah Al Fatih is repeated more than any other surah. Even more than Surah Al Ikhlas and more than Surah Al Nas. Because in one rakat you read Surah Fatih and you read Surah Ikhlas, the next rakat you don't read Surah Fatih and Surah Ikhlas again. You read back Surah Fatih, but you read another surah. So every rakat you're reading Surah Fatiha, but you do not read another, that same Surah with Surah Al-Fatiha, you read a different Surah. So it is known as the seven ayahs which are mostly repeated. So that is another name for Surah Al-Fatiha, which is Sabah Al-Mathani, the seven most repeated ayahs. It is also known as Al-Hamd. So this Surah, Surah Al-Fatiha, is also known as Surah Al-Hamd. So the chapter of praise, because in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah begins it with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So it tells us that the name of the surah also is Surah Al-Ham. Also it is known as Surah Al-Salat. It is known as Surah Al-Salat. We know what is Salat, Salat is prayers. But this is known as Surah Al-Salat. The chapter of the Salat, chapter of the prayers. And we will go to a hadith which is coming up very soon wherein Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divided the salat into two. Allah has divided his salat into two and the salat that he is speaking about in that hadith refers to Surah Al-Fatiha. So Allah calls Surah Al-Fatiha salat. When we know salat is prayers, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Surah Al-Fatiha as salat. So that is why Surah Al-Fatih is also given the name of As-Salat. It is also known as As-Shifa. It is also known as As-Shifa. As-Shifa means cure. It is that Surah that cures. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in a hadith which was narrated by Sa'id bin Al-Jubayr, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Fatiha Al-Kitab, Shifa Min Kulli Sam. That Fatiha Al-Kitab, Surah Al-Fatiha, it is a shifa, it is a cure for all sickness. It's a cure for all sickness, Surah Al-Fatiha. That's why long ago, when you go to somebody or you go to the Imam to get jari, if you know, I think everybody knows the term jari. 
most of the time one of the surahs that you read is Surah Al-Fatiha because Surah Al-Fatiha has the power to cure as also there is a narration that it was done in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it cured an individual by the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala so we have Surah Al-Fatiha also being named Ash-Shifa also it is known as Surah Al-Ruqya Surah Al-Ruqya Ruqya is incantation so that is also we will go in a hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a man he was sick and Surah al fatiha was read on him and he was cured. Also it is known as Asas quran the foundation of the Qur'an. So Surah Asas quran the chapter which is the foundation of the Qur'an. And then it is also known as Surah Al-Waqiyah. We are accustomed with Surah Al-Waqiyah with an ayn at the end. This now is Surah Al-Waqiyah with a ya at the end. Surah Al-Waqiyah. Waqiyah means the protector. This is the chapter that protects you. So it is also known as a surah that protects one. Then we have Surah Al-Kafiyah. Surah Al-Kafiyah. Kafiyah means that which is sufficient. A surah which is sufficient. As long as you read this surah, it will suffice for you. Allah will protect you, Allah will give you anything that you ask for as long as you read this surah, which is Surah al Fatiha, which is also known as Surah al Kafiya. Then we have Surah al Kans. It is also known as Surah al Kans. Kans, which means treasure. So it is a surah of the treasures. It means in it there are a lot of treasures. So these are the different names of Surah al Fatiha. So a quick recap of the names. We have first we had Ummul Kitab, which is the mother of the book. Then we had Ummul Quran, which is number two. Then we have Surah Al Hamd. We have Surah Al Salat, Surah Al Sab'ul Mathani, Surah Al Shifa, Surah Al Ruqya, Surah Al Asas Al Quran, Surah Al Waqiya, Surah Al Kafiya, and Surah Al Kans. So these are the different names of Surah Al Fatiha. Now the word Fatiha in itself, the word Fatiha. Fatiha comes from Fataha Yafta, which means to open something. So if I want to say, I open the door, I say Fatahtul Baab, I open the door from the word Fataha. So Fataha, you have the word Fatiha, which means the opener. And there's two surahs that have very similar name in the Quran that starts with the, the root letters Fata and Ha, Fataha. We have Surah Al Fatiha and Surah Al Fatih. So there's another surah in the Quran also that is known as Surah Al Fatih, which is, I think, to, closer to the, to the last para. You have Surah Al Fatih. So you have these two surahs. Fatiha, as I mentioned, means the opener. And Fat, which means the opening, which is the victory, translated as the victory. So when we say it is the opening chapter of the Quran, by Allah calling it Surah Al Fatiha, the opening chapter, when you have an introduction, your entire speech should be based upon your introduction. So this is your opening speech, this is the opening chapter of the Quran, then all the surahs will be details of what was mentioned in Surah Al Fatiha. And that is why we call it as well Asas al Quran, the foundation of the Quran. So you have Surah al Fatiha, and every single thing that is mentioned in the entire Quran, 113 surahs that will come after it, everything will be based on what was mentioned in Surah al Fatiha. And it's only seven ayats. But that seven ayats, every single thing is concise in that seven ayats. So this is the introduction of the Quran. And then from this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to make it in details for you. So this is Surah Al-Fatih. The amount of kalimas, the amount of words in Surah Al-Fatih, there are 25 words. So Surah Al-Fatih consists of 25 words. And it has 113 letters. So you have, it is only consisting 25 words and 113 letters. We want to some of the virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha. Abu Sa'id bin Al-Mu'alla radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he said, Kuntu usalli, I was praying salat. 
So this Sahabi, he was performing his Salat, فَدَعَانِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَامَ And Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم called me. So now he is in his Salat, praying, and the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم calls him. So he's thinking, what should I do? Should I break my Salat and go listen to what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم wants to see me about? Or should I complete my Salat and then go to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم? So this Sahabi, he said, you what, I'm going to complete my Salat and then I'm going to go to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. فَلَمْ أَجِبْهُ He didn't answer Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم until he finished praying. Because you know if he goes, he'll break his Salat. So he wanted to ensure he finished praying his Salat and then go to Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم. When he finished, he came to Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم. And Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم says to him, مَا مَنَاكَ أَن تَأْتِيَنِي what prevented you from coming to me? Why it is that I called you and you didn't respond to me? You didn't come and find out what I wanted. He says to him, to ya Rasulullah, inni kuntu salli. I was praying salat. I was praying salat. I wanted to complete my salat. He says, Rasulullah Rasul says to him, Have you not heard what Allah says in the Quran? Ya ayu ladina amanu stajibu lillahi wa lirrasul idha da'akum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you believe, answer Allah and His Messenger whenever they call you. So Allah commands the believers, as long as the Prophet, as well as Allah calls you, you must answer the call. So how he was calling the Sahabi, he was supposed to break his salat and go to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and then repeat his salat. Because it is more important to listen to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he didn't know, out of not knowing, he completed his salat. After that, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, Inni law allimuka a'adama suratun fil Qur'an. He says, I'm going to teach you the greatest surah in the Qur'an. So now he's hearing Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It shows that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not angry with him. If he was angry with him, he wouldn't have wanted to teach him something like this. So to show that he wasn't angry, it's just that he called for the individual and the response is that he should have come immediately. So he says, I'm going to teach you the greatest surah of the Qur'an before you come out of the masjid. Before you leave this masjid, I'm going to tell you the best surah, the greatest surah of the Qur'an. فَأَخَذَ بِيَدَيَّ So he hold his hands and he was walking to come out of the masjid. And he realized that he thought to himself that Rasul ﷺ forgot about what he told him, that he's going to tell him the greatest surah of the Qur'an. So when he realized that, he said, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you tell me that you were going to inform me of the greatest surah of the Qur'an? And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Naam, yes, I'm going to tell you of the greatest surah. And he says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. That is the greatest surah of the Qur'an. We know different surahs have specialities, different qualities. Like Surah Yasin, as we all know, is a surah of the, considered to be the heart of the Qur'an. We have Surah al mulk that helps you in the grave, protect you from the punishment of the grave. You have Surah al waqiyah that removes poverty from your life. So all these surah have specialities. But there is no surah that could compare to Surah Al-Fatiha. So Rasulullah is saying the greatest surah in the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha. Another narration, Rasulullah wasallam, he had called Ubayy bin Ka'b. A similar narration to what took place, he called Ubay bin Kaab again, he didn't re respond to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And after he pr finished praying, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to him, I'm going to teach you about a surah that was not revealed in the Torah. A surah, a chapter of the Quran, the likeness of it was not given to Prophet Musa alayhi wa sallam in his Torah. It was not given to Prophet Jesus alayhi wa sallam in the Injil, neither it is nowhere else in the Quran. So this surah, even the entire Qur'an besides this surah, there's nowhere else that have any other surah that is better than this surah. And then he says that is surah Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So this is considered to be the greatest surah. And he says this is a surah, كَيْفَ تَقْرُوا إِذَا فُتِحَةِ salat. This is a surah that you begin your salat with. This is a surah that we read in our salat. Aqil. He says that Jabir radiallahu said, "In tahaytu ila Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." I came to Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was pouring out some water. Normally, in those days, they didn't have the tap that we have, just just open and we we make our wudu. 
everything they will have containers and they will pour into the containers and take that and make their wudu and their stinja and so forth. So he came whilst Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was pouring out some water. So I said to him, As-salamu alayka ya Rasul Allah. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't reply to him. Then he said a second time, As-salamu alayka ya Rasul Allah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't reply for the second time. The third time, As-salamu alayka ya Rasul Allah. Again, he didn't reply. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his bowl of water and he walked and he entered into his room. So this individual, he felt sad, thinking to himself, I give the Prophet Sallallahu salams, and he didn't reply. And we know how important it is to reply to salams. So he was, he, the first thing he started to think to himself is, you know what, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi may be angry with me. But it has to be something that I have done that might have displeased him, and that's why he's behaving like that with me. So he went in the masjid and he was very sad, thinking to himself, what could I have done? that could have bring about this kind of displeasure to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out after some time and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was purified because he was taking the water to perform tahara, be it wudu or maybe gusul, whatever it was, he was purifying himself. So when he finished purifying himself, he came out and he said to the individual, Wa alayka salam, wa alayka salam, wa alayka salam. He said it three times. Because the individual, when he gives salam, he gives salam three times. So now he does, he wanted to reply the same amount of times the individual gives, he replied the salam three times. And then he says to him, Allah ukhbiruka ya Abdullah bin Jabir. Should I not inform you, bi akhyara suratun fil Quran, which is the greatest surah in the Quran. I says, bala ya Rasulullah, and then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he recited surah Fatiha until the end there the entire Surah Fatiha. So he tells them that this is the greatest Surah of the Qur'an. In another narration from Sayyid al-Khudri, he says that we were on a journey. On this journey, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was absent, he was not with us. So this group of Sahaba, they were on a journey, and they reached this village, and one of the individuals from the village, they came, to this group of Sahabas and they says to him, one of our chief is very sick. One of our chief, he's very sick and there's no one that could cure him. We have no one that could look after him that could cure him. So one of the Sahaba, he stood and he says, take me to him. And the individual, they took this Sahaba to the leader, the chief, one of their chiefs, and he recited something and the individual was cured. He recited something and the individual was cured. They didn't know what he recited. He just recited that, the individual was cured. And then the leader of the tribe, he says to him, I'm going to give you 30 sheep. I'm going to give you this amount of sheep to distribute amongst your other friends, your other companions, as a, as a reward of what you have done. You have cured our, our chief. So he accepted it. And then he came to the Sahabas. The Sahabas asked him, what did you recite? How did you, what did you say to cure the individual? And he says to them, I recited Surah Al-Fatiha. The only thing he recited, Surah Al-Fatiha. Not Surah Baqarah, not Surah Ali Imran, no big Surah. The only Surah he recited was Surah Al-Fatiha. So now the Sahabas were curious. Could you really recite a Surah to cure someone? Could you recite a Surah, blow it on someone, and could that individual be cured? As well as, could you accept a gift for reciting the Qur'an for someone? If somebody comes to Jari, as you can see, is it allowed for you to, if they, you didn't ask them for anything, but they want to give you something, if it is allowed for you to accept it? Because that is, this is the first time this is happening. This has never happened before. So they said, we remained quiet. We didn't say anything. We didn't quarrel with the individual. We just leave him, and we allowed him to keep all his sheep. We didn't participate in any. Anyway, they went back to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and soon they reached Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they informed him. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, Ma yudri annahu rupya. How did you know that Surah Al-Fatiha could have cured the individual? Ask him, how did you know Surah Al-Fatiha could have cured the individual? So it tells us from this question of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that there are certain parts of the Qur'an that could be used in order of curing different sickness. 
Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says in the Quran in Surah of Bani Israel, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِلَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ الشِّفَاءُ وَرَحْمَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ That we have sent them the Quran as a cure and a mercy for the believers. So the Quran in itself is a cure. The Quran is a cure spiritually as well as physically. So even physical sickness, physical ailments, the Quran is possible that it could cure as long as it is recited with sincerity and belief that Allah will use this as a means of cure and it could happen. So that cleared up that it is allowed to use the Quran. Next thing, could you accept? Could you accept a favor or a gift because of you reading Quran and helping someone? Rasulullah says to the individual, put my share aside for me. From the sheep that was given, he says to him, put my share aside. So if he is going to accept it, Rasulullah is accepting it, he's given confirmation that the Sahaba should also accept it. So it tells us that it is allowed as well to do that. So one thing we, we have is the power of Surah Al-Fatiha. That Surah Al-Fatiha is, is what is used as a means of curing. We go on to another narration from Ibn Abbas, Surah He says that whilst we were with Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Jibreel Alayhi Salam was with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. So Jibreel Alayhi Salam had came with some revelation, and he was with Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then there was a noise above the head. There was a noise in the heaven. And Jibreel alayhi salam as well as Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam looked upwards to the sky. And when they looked upwards, Jibreel alayhi salam lowered his gaze and says to Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam, هذا باب قد قطها من السماء ما قطها قطتو. He says to him, there is a door that has been opened today that was never opened before. There's a door in heaven that has been opened today that has never been opened before. It says, minhu malakun. An angel came to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he granted him glad tidings of two lights. And that two lights, he says, there's no other prophet who has given these two lights which I have been given. So this door from heaven was opened specially for these two lights to be given to Rasul Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And no other prophets, even Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Jesus alayhi salam, no other prophet was given these two lines that was given to Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam. One, because that door was never opened before. This is the first time that door in heaven has been opened so that these two lines could come down. And then Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam, he says, the two lines that were given to me, Surah Al-Fatiha, and the last two ayats of Surah Al-Baqarah, from Amal Rasulu until the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. So he says, these were the two lights given to me, and no one else was given, no, one, no other prophet before me was given it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that I have separated the salah between me and between my servants. This is where we get the name Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Salat. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qasamtu as salatu bayni wa bayna abdi. I have separated the salat between me and my servants. And when we go to the we go to the hadith, we'll see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking about. He says, Whenever my servants say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies. So when we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and say, Hamadani abdi, my servant has praised me. So whenever you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you get an immediate reply. So it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take a year or two years to reply to you. Every time you read the first ayat, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah replies immediately. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hamadani abdi, my servant has praised me. And when my servant says, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful, Allah says, Atna alayya abdi, my servant has glorified me. So Allah responds immediately again, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Atna alayya abdi, my servant has glorified me. And when he says, Malik yawmiddin, Allah says, Majadani abdi, my servant, my servant has praised me. And another time he says, Fawwadu ila abdi. My servant has placed his trust in me. And 
Another narration, it says, Fawudani Abdi, my servant has placed his trust in me. And then, Iya kana abudu wa iya kana sta'in. When we say, Iya kana abudu wa iya kana sta'in, Allah says, Hada baini wa baina abdi. This is between me and my servant. Because what we are saying, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. We are making this, this affirmation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you is my Lord, I'm going to only worship you, and I'm going to only ask from you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is between me and my servant. This is a covenant between me and my servant. And for my servant, whatever he asks, anything my servant asks for me, I'm ready to give him. And then he will say, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim." Surat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim Qairil maghdubi alayhim wa ladhalim And then Allah will say Hada li abdi This is for my servant This is the dua my servant is making This is for my servant And I will give my servant whatever he asks for So when he asks for guidance You know Allah is saying I've given him guidance And Allah replies So if you remember the beginning of the hadith From Suh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He says Qasam tu salat Allah says that I've divided Salat. But the whole Hadith, was he speaking about the Salat that we are praying? The whole Hadith was speaking about Surah Al-Fatiha. Each ayat of Surah Al-Fatiha, when the servant says Surah Al-Fatiha, and the response that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives when we say Surah Al-Fatiha. And that is why we say Salat, one of the name of Surah Al-Fatiha is Surah Salat. And it is also Mustahab, which is known as Desirable, that whenever we read Surah Al-Fatiha, we should not join the ayats. Even though there's no problem in joining the ayats. So don't get me with the fact that you should never join the ayats. It's okay to join the ayats, but it's just mustahab. Mustahab means it is desirable that you read one ayat at a time. So that when you finish one ayat, Allah responds to you. Then you read the next ayat, Allah responds to you. Read the third ayat, Allah responds to you. So after each ayat, you know to yourself, Allah has just responded to me. Then you try to join all the ayats together one time. So it's better to do it like that, one ayat at a time. But as I mentioned, there's no sin upon an individual who feels like joining an ayat. Neither there will not be any kind of punishment given to an individual who do that. So if somebody joins the ayat, there's no problem in doing that as well. Now, is Surah Al-Fatiha compulsory in our Salat? Do we have to read Surah Al-Fatiha in our Salat? We know that we always read Surah Al-Fatiha. But is it that we have to read Surah Al-Fatiha in our Salat? Is it compulsory or is it incumbent or is it Sunnah? Is it optional? What is Surah Al-Fatiha? What is the ruling of Surah Al-Fatiha for our Salat? According to some scholars, which for example, we, I guess everyone here will be following Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah. See, Imam Abu Hanifa's view is that it is not compulsory, it is wajib. So there's a wajib act in Salat, it is not compulsory to read Surah Al-Fatiha. Whereas others like Imam Ash-Shafi, Rahimullah, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, they have the view that it is compulsory to read Surah Al-Fatiha in Salat. So you have two conflicting views, one saying that it is compulsory, one saying, no, it is not compulsory, it is wajib. Now the, the difference is, if, some, if you're following the Shafi and you miss out Surah Al-Fatiha, then you have no Salat, you have to repeat your Salat. If for Imam Abu Hanifa, if you forget Surah Al-Fatiha, then you still have your Salat because it is not a compulsory element in Salat. And why does Imam Ash-Shafi say that it is compulsory? There's a hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he says, La salata illa liman, La salata liman lam yaqra bi fatiha tul kitab. There's no salah for that one who didn't read Surah Al Fatiha. So there's a hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, There's no salat if you didn't read Surah Al Fatiha. So outwardly, you will say, He is doing the right thing. Imam Ash Shafi is doing the right thing. The Prophet said, What he said, You have no salat if you didn't read Surah Al Fatiha. So how could Imam Abu Hanifa say that it is wajib? How could Imam Abu Hanifa tell us now that it is not compulsory and the Prophet already said there is no salat except that you must read Surah Fatiha. If you leave it out, you have no salat. Imam Abu Hanifa, he is of the opinion as you mentioned that it is wajib. Because according to him, compulsory actions could only come from the Quran. 
Right? One of his ruling, compulsory actions comes from the Quran. Wajib and Sunnah actions come from the Hadith. So whatever is compulsory, for example, the other compulsory parts of the Salat, like standing, ruku, sajda, that is in the Quran. Those commands are in the Quran. So he says the compulsory actions are found in the Quran, and the Hadith of Rasulullah the rulings will only give you that which is that which is Sunnah or Wajib. So because of the severity of that Hadith, he didn't say that it is Sunnah, he said that this is Wajib. So if you leave it out, then you have to make sajda to sahwi in order to recompense your salat. So it's not that if you feel like to read Surah Fatiha, you feel. You still have to read it, but it is not compulsory. As well as you use an ayat of the Quran. And Allah says, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ Quran." Allah says, read what is easy from the Quran. So Allah, when Allah commands you to read Quran in the Salat, Allah didn't say read Surah Fatih in their Salat. Allah says read whatever is easy for you in the Quran. Now if an individual just accepted Islam, and many of them sometimes, instead of learning Surah Fatih, they learn Surah Ikhlas. They only learn Kulu Allah Wahad because that sounds very easy and they memorize that. And they want to pray Salat. Which one is more easier, Surah Fatiha or Surah Ikhlas? They don't know Surah Fatiha, so they read Surah Ikhlas. It will be accepted. Because Allah says, read what is easy from the Quran. See, Imam Abu Hanifa says, reading what is easy is compulsory. Reading what is easy is compulsory, but reading Surah Fatiha is wajib. So this is the ruling we get from Imam Abu Hanifa. <coughs> the next ruling of Surah Al-Fatiha, which will be the last ruling, and then we'll close for some questions. <coughs> Do you have to read Surah Fatiha behind the Imam? If you are praying Salat and the Imam, he's reading Surah Al-Fatiha. Do you, as a muktari, as a follower, do you have to read Surah Al-Fatiha? According to some scholars, they say, yes, you have to read Surah Al-Fatiha. But according to Imam Abu Hanifa again, he says, no, you don't have to read Surah Al-Fatiha. So, for example, the Maghrib Salat and the Isha Salat and Fajr Salat, the Imam, he reads aloud. So when he reads aloud, then whatever recitation he reads, that is sufficient for the followers. The followers do not have to read. All they have to do is listen. And Imam Abu Hanifa, he uses one ayat of the Quran and a hadith to prove this, to bring about this law, the hadith that he used, إِذَا جُوِلَ imam لِيَتَمُّ bi. The Imam was placed there so that you should follow him. That is the reason you have an Imam. If it was for you to read everything by yourself, then you should have gone one side and read. The only reason that you have an Imam in front so that you should follow the Imam. So the only reason Rasulullah is saying that the Imam is there is so that you should, he should be followed at all times. Then he says, whenever the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, only then you go and you say, Allahu Akbar. Because you are following the Imam. But then Rasulullah Sallallahu he says, وَإِذَا قَرَعَ فَأَنْسِتُ Whenever he starts to read, then you should be quiet. You should remain quiet. Because the command is that, إِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِئُوا لَهُ وَأَنْسِتُ Whenever the Qur'an has been recited, Allah says, you should be quiet and listen. So that is a command from Allah. So if the Imam is reading, you're supposed to be quiet, listening to the recitation of the Imam. And whatever recitation he recites, that is sufficient for you. So if you read a long surah, you read a short surah, whatever he reads, you get the same amount of blessings as him. So you don't need to try your best to recite after him. Now as for the silent salat, the silent salat, Zohar and Asr. So for example, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr, you hear the recitation. You hear Surah Fatiha, you hear the other Surah. So you could be quiet and just listen. But Zohar, you're not hearing anything. You do not know when the, when the Imam is reading Surah Fatiha or not. You do not know when the Imam is reading the next Surah. You don't know anything, you're just standing there. So according to some scholars, they say that you should recite Surah Fatiha. Some scholars of the opinion. And among the Hanafi, they have two views. Imam Abu Hanifa itself, he says, no, you should not read Surah Al-Fatiha. 
And the reason he says you should not read Surah Fatiha, even though you're not hearing it, because the Imam was placed there to be followed, as well as whatever he's reading is sufficient for you. So his view is that you do not need to read Surah Al-Fatiha in silent salat behind the Imam as well. But a lot of scholars among the Hanafi, for example, some of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, and those that came after Imam Abu Hanifa but followed the Hanafi Madhab, they have the opinion that it is allowed for the silent salat if you want to concentrate. Now when you're not seeing anything, your mind all over. So you start to think about this thing, you start to think about that thing. If you are hearing the Imam reciting, you could try to focus by listening to how he's reciting, listening to the ayat, so you're able to have a good amount of concentration. Now you're not hearing anything, and you're not seeing anything, it is easier for the shaitan to bring about things in your mind. So the latter scholars now have the opinion that it is allowed only Surah Al-Fatiha for the individual. If he wants, he could read it as a means of building up his concentration behind the Imam. That is only for the silent Salat. As for the loud Salat, you already have something to listen to, so you do not need to read it. That listening can bring about your concentration.